We're still waiting for uh, Alicia, who's my colleague and who's running this session, but she's been delayed and is on the way. I think she'll be here in a minute or two. Um, I'll start then maybe Alicia is going to MC the whole meeting and I would really like her to do that, but in uh, being mindful of the time, I'll start by giving you background on the setup of this session, because this is a session that builds on a, a so-called Day Zero event, Day Zero advocacy event called Commons Cause, which we organize as a group of partner organizations that included Wikimedia Europe, Wikimedia Foundation, Open Knowledge Foundation, um, Creative Commons, and my organization, Open Future. And I'm mentioning this because this was a very important setup for us, a setup that was meant to fulfill the idea of collaboration in the open, which is the theme of today, of of, of Wikimania, um, but more importantly, simply doing what we believe is the way to do advocacy. If I think if you're interested in the topic, you might have been in sessions where we talk a lot about challenges of doing advocacy, how it's hard work, how outreach is hard, how there are not a lot of resources, how not a lot of capacities, how these are difficult issues. These are, for all these reasons, our relatively small, some bigger, some smaller, but in the big picture of things, not huge and powerful organizations need to work together. So we had this meeting and um, the main idea of this session um, today is to sort of report back, but we will not do the typical report back because from my at least personal experience, usually they're a lot less fun than the original thing from which they're reporting, but we want to share a bit with you the spirit. And one of the main issues is how to do advocacy in cooperation with various partners and communities. So this is the theme of this meeting. Uh, we have with us um, representatives of various organizations, but we still don't have Alicia, and we hit a point where I cannot uh, replace her, so I will step out and call her, and I hope she's somewhere. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I also came, as you see. Uh, um, so, welcome to this Friday session. We're going to be talking about collaboration in the open and for the open. And so we're going to be talking about it in the, in the context of advocacy and the collaboration we have in mind is between organizations, but also about community engagement when it comes to advocacy, so also collaboration with activists. And so this session is here so that we can talk about the Day Zero event that Alec has described. I guess he also said who he was, <laughs> right? He, um, he's my boss. My name is Alicia Peszkowska and I work as an engagement lead at Open Future, where Alec is a co-founder and director. And I'm just going to be a moderator today, and we're going to be talking to a few representatives or the, of the organizations that helped us organize the Day Zero event and who also deal with advocacy efforts when it comes to knowledge commons. And maybe I'm going to invite them to the stage right now. Well, one of the panelists is Alec, but I guess he's going to be, he's gone, but maybe he's going to be back and he's going to take his seat. And then we have, we have Rebecca, Rebecca Ross from Creative Commons, 
communications manager for the Open Climate Campaign. You go. Thank you. We have Anna Masgal, who is the executive director of Wikimedia Europe. Patricio Del Boca, who is a tech lead and also an open activist at the Open Knowledge Foundation. We also have at least two participants of the Day Zero. We have Poncelet and Iglica, who I'm going to introduce a bit more later because we would like to hear from them too and their perceptions and reflections of the Day Zero. Is there anyone else here that was there on Monday? No, but, uh, but we want to get a bit of a sense of who you are in the audience. So if you could, if everyone who feels like they have a good understanding of what is advocacy work in the context of the Knowledge Commons, if you could raise your hand. Okay, that's great. And if you maybe have an experience in this kind of work, if you could also raise your hand. Okay, we have a crowd of experts. Um, and if you're excited and you think it's worth it to pursue advocacy efforts when it comes to Knowledge Commons, hooray. Okay, amazing. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask like just a question of the panelists about their work in this context and about how everyone can maybe, what are the touch points between this work and the community. We're gonna talk a little bit about the experiences of the participants, and we're gonna open it all for discussion. Alec, come on. <laughs> ah, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit in a second, but just wanna ask the first question. The questions are long. <laughs> Um, so, what's your organization's approach to advocacy and mobilizing the community for support? And I don't know, maybe Rebecca, you could start. Hi, every Hi everybody. Yeah, this is working. I'm Rebecca from Creative Commons. Um, and thanks very much to all those that organized the Common Cause event. I think it was really worthwhile for us to come together and talk about advocacy and sort of, it almost felt like an opportunity to reset in this new context and think about what we want to prioritize going forward. So, um, I mean, I think I'm going to be sort of the annoying panelist to a certain extent and start with, like, it, it really depends on how we define advocacy because I think sometimes we convolute advocacy with things like promotion, awareness building, relationship building, even communication. Um, and my sense is that we as a community need to do all of those things first to be able to do strong advocacy in a really meaningful way. So if I think about what where we are at Creative Commons, it's really building up those elements, you know, making sure that there's strong communication infrastructure, strong strategy infrastructure, good awareness building. Um, and, you know, the thing that is really interesting about working at an organization like Creative Commons is that we're both an organization with staff, but we're also a global community. So it feels, you know, like really ripe to do shared advocacy. Shared advocacy is also really hard because there's so many different uh, uh, needs and approaches and ideas. So to just talk a little bit, you know, to really answer the question in terms of our approach, um, we're really trying to approach advocacy in terms of uh, open. So any time that we can use open to solve problems, uh, any time that we can uh, almost position open as a tool, as a framework, as a solution to other individuals' problems. So a good example would be um, you know, a national government that uh, is funding research publications, wants to make sure that those research publications are available openly so we can go in and help them develop an open access strategy. Um, and the other point for us in terms of advocacy is uh, really about true like legal and policy interventions. So making sure that we have strong stances around copyright and that's getting uh, harder day by day, especially in light of generative AI. 
Um, I think uh, there are really three layers in terms of how we think about advocacy at CC as well. It's connecting with partner organizations like events like this. It's the work of the community and working with local and regional groups. And then there's this general awareness. I think that generally people don't really see that they are sharing on the internet all the time. Um, their sharing is happening through platforms and the world will change in terms of how open licenses are applied to that. So we've been thinking quite a lot about, you know, the advocacy as well to, to the general public. Um, I guess the other thing I would just say, and this is sort of a bit of a future goal for us at Creative Commons, is we would really like to be able to take stronger stances that can then be reused in different regional, local, institutional contexts, um, and really to better understand what our community of those, anyone basically who has ever applied a CC license, needs from us in this rapidly changing environment. Um, so I think that's where I'll pause for that question. Amazing. Maybe Anna now. So if I, sorry, it's the third and fourth days for us actually. So uh, I just want to make sure that I remember the question. So uh, the, uh, thank you so much. Yes. So advocacy initiatives and how we work with the community. Yes. How the yes. Uh, organizational approaches advocacy. Uh, community, yeah. uh, thank you so much, Rebecca. Oh. Um, so yeah, I'm Anna from Wikimedia Europe. Wikimedia Europe is the, um, let's call it an assembly of uh, European uh, affiliates of Wikimedia. And um, the organization is young, but our work actually started uh, over 10 years ago, uh, thanks to uh, many factors, including my colleague Dimi that is here in the room, um, uh, specifically from public policy and advocacy work. And uh, in the EU, I think we have this specific context, or in Europe we have this specific context because we have the European Union as a political organism that is basically discussing about legal and political framework uh, or policy frameworks for European Union, so the countries that are uh, assembled together um, and uh, constitute a, a big part of the whole continent. So it makes sense to speak to the European Union about issues such as access to knowledge and freedom of expression and user rights, um, because when that happens in the countries, that's already after the EU established those frameworks, so it's uh, much less effective. So, uh, so there was a center of gravity created, and it still is there, and, uh, and we're doing this work in many topics and iterations, uh, starting with issues related to copyright and then going through other legislation that uh, potentially had impact on uh, freedom of expression. And of course, also topics such as uh, Digital Services Act, that is then uh, the liability of online platforms for the content, how it's regulated or how it's not regulated. Um, and uh, of course, now uh, after the European elections, uh, there will be uh, the new parliament already has constituted its com committees and the European Commission is deciding also about both the personal uh, setup but also of the topics they want to pick up for the next five years. So, so this work will be further modified by this. Um, we also try to, of course, uh, be as possible, as, uh, as proactive as possible in also basically telling decision makers, hey, different internet is possible, right? It's we're not only uh, talking about internet that is built by the big uh, platforms that have a lot of market power, but also there are those places on the internet where communities decide and govern for themselves what they want to put out and also how they want to work. And of course, Creative Commons also has uh, uh, impact in, in that field and so do other organizations. Um, so. Um, so this is uh, just to, to give you an idea of what we focus on, but communities for us are super important just because uh, there's such a direct impact on the way they work, the way what they can and cannot do uh, in terms of uh, basically providing content through Wikipedia, Wikimedia Commons and other projects that it's simply unthinkable to not talk to them and also bring their perspectives and also give platforms so that they can come to Brussels and talk about this. Uh, 
to uh, with the decision makers uh, because that work should serve them right not uh, uh, not just us so um, and we can bring this broader perspective uh, because unlike some platforms we don't think that internet is only what happens on their platform we think it's uh, the, the health of this whole space is important we sometimes of course also have a more general voice but the 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 nucleus of our work is to center the communities and their needs and their interests in uh, in that work um, so so that's that's one aspect of it that ma makes us do it um, it's of course uh, uh, needs to be said that we work a lot with the global policy team of Wikimedia Foundation because they are the uh, uh, entity responsible for uh, or liable for uh, some of the infringements. So of course we also need to understand uh, what are their uh, needs and what works from that perspective and not. But uh, we work with Euro in Europe with people that are here, and we're very happy to see that over that time. Uh, more and more uh, European organizations of Wikimedia, European chapters, uh, who have staff or uh, volunteers consider participating in those conversations, which means resources, right? It's human resources, it's time, it's know-how. So we're very happy to see this and we try to support them as much as we can and work also with them. Um, so uh, it has a very practical dimension and one that maybe is not the most... Um, time effective, but I think it really brings what it needs to be, which is that we work a lot, uh, uh, we provide a lot of ta tailored approach. So we cannot work with many people at once, but, uh, but I think really it's better to understand what that specific community needs, what is, for example, their situation. So in France, there is a lot of legislation that really goes against what the Digital Services Act is going to say, um, or maybe not a lot of legislation, but a lot of ideas within the within the new legislation. Um, uh, so we help with with that particular work to to understand what can be done and to hone the talking points. And you know all this, uh, all, you know all the shop. I know that there are many people here, so I don't need to explain this. But and then um, in Italy, there's a really a re, uh, like a reverse hit on. Um, on public domain with some administrative fees that could be considered licensing as the effect, but uh, but are not really licenses. Therefore, the, 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 it remains to be seen what the courts will say about this mechanism as actually limiting access to public domain. So we're also coordinating with the Italian team to understand uh, how to support them, how to give visibility to that particular uh, topic. So, uh, I mean, I could talk a long time and also, I, honestly, Dimi should be here and explain this because he is the person who does <laughs> this work. Um, uh, so, um, so we can also, hopefully, if you agree, Dimi, involve you in any questions that people may have later about this. Sorry, it was very long. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. It was very comprehensive. Um, and it's all also about like breaking down, you know, your organization's approach uh, to advocacy. Patricio, should yes. I repeat the question? No, thank you. I, you I remember it. it. Oh. Um, so my name is Patricio El Boca, currently working as a technical leader of the Open Knowledge Foundation, which has like a long tradition of advocating for openness. It started advocating for openness when I was in high school. So, <laughs> um, and in terms of what is our current approach uh, for advocacy, I think I can like pinpoint to like four different parts of our strategy. Um, the first one is like the definition of key pressing issues that we want to work on. Um, so for us, like this zero event day in which we get together uh, with other organizations to define, okay, what is like the pressing issues, what are like the hot topics that we need to work, is like highly like important for us because that's where we get feedback on what the community wants to work in and also what the world needs in terms of like uh, advocacy. And then we create like a document, an internal document with like two or three points that is like suitable for us to work. We share it with our network. We have a network that is present in more like 40 countries in the world to receive feedback, to see if it aligns with their current necessities and the local necessities. Then when we have like the advocacy plan or like at least like the key issues that we want to work on in the year, what we do is like a strong communication and alignment inside the organization and with the network. We have like network calls like every month in which we discuss these topics, and we receive feedbacks about it. So we make sure that every people in the organization and every chapter of the network and every collaborator um, 
is aligned to what are the works. Um, that's the second point, like communication and alignment. Uh, like the third step or important part is like um, we promote a lot and support the centralized events um, in, in order to do advocacy. Um, one example of this one is like the Open Data Day. Mm -hmm. um, Open Data Day is, is like a beautiful example because it's like a small grant that we give to local communities with no string attached. Um, only what we require is like a small blog post uh, in which they describe like their their experience and, and the results of the event but because we are strictly aligned uh, we have like a clear understanding of what are the goals kind of like what are the limits um, we trust the community and they can go they can do whatever they they want um, and then we receive and that creates like advocacy at the most local level because we receive events from local municipalities in Colombia, in Zambia, in Tanzania, in, um, in Argentina, in Italy. So it's like a really global way to reach um, people. Um, and also in, 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 in the centralized ways, um, another experience that we have is the Opens Go Cop that we talk a little bit like during this event. A person from our network, Max, like he has like 20 something years old. He's really young, but he was like in the COP event year, two years ago, and he says, hey, the open movement is not in the COP event. Um, so I want to create a movement to start like taking the open discussions to the COP. Completely centralized, we create, we, and we provide support, uh, we provide alignment, and we provide our, our structure, and we let him grow and leave that, that community. Um, in a completely decentralized way. But because of the step two, that we communicate and that we are aligned, we, we trust the process. And, and third and fourth point, and, and, and last one in, in our approach, is like us, as the Open Knowledge Foundation, we, that has more like a global reach, we participate in like top level uh, forums um, and discussions. So for example, the G20, for example, the UN, um, and we do like a strong advocacy there, like for example, like policy briefings. Uh, this year we get together with Fundar, which is like an organization of Argentina, mm -hmm. um, and we w work together in a policy brief for the T20 in Brazil, um, and we presented the paper, and it got approved and we did the same with another organization so in these high level forums uh, we put like the experience and and, and and the and the baggage of the organization to create like policy brief and and an and impact and influence in those decisions so in a summary is like vision mission alignment with the community our network do, do the advocacy at the local level and as an organization go to like the more top level approaches a very structured grassroots approach and it's also very interesting that every organization obviously has a little bit of a different approach and also operates in different contexts. Um, Alec? Um, so I will speak maybe from a slightly different perspective which comes from the fact that uh, Open Future is a think tank. By this we mean I realize actually that sometimes it's confusing and think tanks sound like organizations that work for corporate clients. That's not what we mean. I think when we say think tank, we mean two things, that we want to be just a bit detached from direct we call it direct advocacy, this sort of immediate work with policymakers, w while still being Im useful in the overall advocacy process. And we try to think how we can look just beyond the current advocacy issues and expand the scope. Uh, and I will say that both things are hard, because what we have learned, and I think this is an insight I like to share, is both of these moves have a risk, we think they're important, but they also run the risk that we lose being relevant. Because actually policy happens very close to policy makers and happens here and now. It's, it is a work that's focused on the current issue, the current big file. Um, the reason we wanted to do this is we felt there is a gap in, in, in these two moves, but they're also risky. So how do we try to deal with them or what are the lessons learned from unsuccess, unsuccessfully um, dealing with them? One thing I want to for first highlight as a specific very let's call it community that we work with, is researchers. We think there's very important work to be done to take insights created by academics and transferring them to the advocacy space. And we really believe we can play that role. Academics do a lot of useful knowledge, sometimes on their own. I think there are more academics, for example, working on uh, the understanding the uh, Digital Services Act 
I, I would bet, okay, we, maybe someone wants to bet because I'm guessing, but I would put a bet that there are more academics than activists, right? Writing pieces that are very uh, academic, uh, meant to be published mainly in journals, but a lot of them feel they want to have an impact. Um, and often their knowledge is very useful. We, for instance, now are working to propose a standard for transparency of AI. This is a current thing that's happening in Europe around the AI Act. And we realize that the best knowledge, really practical knowledge, is in the minds of computer scientists. So uh, the successful process for us is to tap into their knowledge, find time to talk with them, but then they, they kind of give us the knowledge and we package it, you know, make it available for policymakers to work with them. So I think this is one very useful strategy. Uh, but the other thing is this whole issue with relevance. I think this is the second thing I want to mention. It, it turns out to be a challenge. We, um, we uh, mm, how to say it, maybe it's, it's, we for example are very much interested in data governance issues, but um, on their own they're extremely uh, abstract. And there seems to be no connection with sort of, I wanted to say reality. Um, so, so this is a moment where even we as a think tank need to find a hook. But then the interesting lesson is you cannot do it on your own. We had this experience um, three years ago. There was a European uh, policy file called the Data Governance Act and then the ATA, Data Act. And in the later one, there was a very interesting piece that concerned making private data uh, shared, forcing companies basically to make data available. Uh, and we thought this is very relevant, but we clicked quickly discovered that among civil society we, are, we have a uni very unusual interest and more or less it was just us. I'm simplifying just a bit. But we saw there's no coalition and we saw how hard it is to push any file um, to, um, uh, on your own. Uh, and this was a big lesson, so where we now feel, because I think there's often in advocacy this thought, uh, is someone else doing it, and if they're already doing it, uh, then maybe we look for something else. And this is what we did, and we learned this is often a very difficult strategy. The best one is still to look for a um, community of fellow advocates. I'll stop here. That was an amazing end to this round of kind of answers to a question. There is a second question, which is... Uh, more of a follow-up to the first one, so like we now we got this overview from important organizations in the field, and this question is about anything specific, specific initiatives that your organization is working on right now that would be like good to good to be like put on this in the spotlight, but also like where the community can engage with what's happening with your work. Um, do you want to like mix the, maybe? There's this joke in Poland that we often say, let's mix the order, and then people start talking and everyone talks like one, two, three, four. And we call it <laughs> Polish random. Yes. Uh, no, so it's Try it, it's run. fun, do Polish random next time you want to mix up the speakers. <laughs> no, so maybe we'll start with Anna this time, and then we do Patricio, and then we do Alec, and then we we'll finish with Rebecca. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we have um, a kind of big list of topics we work on um, or what's on our minds. I think they, um, and I maybe I won't just like, be listing them and describing, maybe just give you a, a bit of an overview sort of also where we are, because I think part of advocacy is a lot of um, internal thinking also in how this all fits together, what is the big picture there, like what is sort of the strategic approach, right? Like this is how we arrive to those smaller points. I think um, I'm not saying anything uh, very um, controversial or, or new here, but but this is how it is. So, um, so I think that there are, uh, of course, the issues that in our case, the European Union is uh, working on. So, um, um, whether it is the implementation of Digital Services Act or whether it's the upcoming implementation of the um, directive on um, and, uh, anti the um, slaps, which is the Timmy, please help me, the strategic litigation against public interest, right? That's the that's the word because it also affects our community. That's one way of preventing people from writing about. Uh, 
public figures is to basically sue them uh, because of alleged defamation. So th there's a mix of that. There are also the topics that we're approached about, uh, which is, for example, AI and the risk-based assessment of the AI Act, because that's the approach that the legislator took. What we think about this, does that affect us? Um, on top of this, there is the fact that Wikipedia as a project became a very large online platform, um, which doesn't concern Wikimedia Europe directly, but because we are in Europe and these are those legislators, we are, of course, also very much plugged into those conversations and, and also learn a lot from the foundation and their teams that work with this about what that really means for the organization and the project. Um, and then also what we're looking at is that, well, there's a lot of chasing of the of the lawmakers uh, in a sense that um, when they want to regulate the internet, I don't think they want to hurt us or communities like ours because I don't think they have a problem with how things work. They also don't know how those things work. But if you take a definition of um, online platform and you base it on basically the fact that somebody holds a space and somebody can put things into that space and other people can access it, it's the same definition for uh, Meta and the same for Wikipedia. So, therefore, whatever concerns, whatever uh, concerns that particular definition, also can backfire at us, right? So, there's a lot of thinking how to talk about spaces like ours because it's not only about Wikipedia; it's also about the Fediverse, right, and the federalized social media and, and so on, in a way that the legislators understand that they have to be a bit more nuanced. Because otherwise we end up with bad lawmaking, which is basically chasing them and saying, hey, could you please give us an exception or give an exception for that particular type of activity on the internet? And that's not good lawmaking, right? Also considering that it's an exception, so it may also change over time. So there's a lot of conversations that we do have how to basically talk about a certain model of activity on the internet that helps the legislators understand and think before they start projecting intervention and when they do the impact assessment, which they should do thoroughly when they think of new uh, policies and new interventions, um, that uh, basically they need to take this into consideration. So then it's also easier work for us because then we don't need to fix this sort of overreaching of, of legislation, which we often talk to them and they say, well, Oh really? This is how it is. Yeah, no, no. It's it's like not for you, right? You, we didn't want to uh, do anything, um, but still, you know, it's in the law. So so certain restrictions can apply to us or certain uh, procedures. Uh, one of the worst case scenarios would be if actually our project need to collect more data than they actually do just to comply with transparency, right? That's that's uh, a basically problem put on its head. So. Uh, so things like this we would want to very much avoid. We're successful so far, but there is a lot of thinking about how to enter the the conceptual process of policy making with evidence and with messaging and with actually talking to the right people because they are not always the same as the ones that then debate the actual law um, with messages that make them realize that they need to be uh, a bit smarter about how they regulate this area. If we could move to Patricio, and I have like a little bit of a like a follow-up question to you too, so that you have almost like one and a half questions because oh, okay. <laughs> during the day zero, um, yes. uh, the event on Monday, um, Open Knowledge Foundation led the, the mapping exercise of different initiatives happening within the community that we should stay aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you could maybe just highlight what you think is uh, was most relevant came out like there is going to be a detailed list we're going to digitize it and and publish it in a couple of weeks so it's going to be accessible and available to everyone but just maybe as a couple of highlights so that people stay excited <laughs> about what's coming yeah perfect because it, it also matches with one of the points of our initiatives this year so I, I'm going to try to connect. Um, so in terms of initiatives that the Open Knowledge Foundation is working on advocacy um, this year, we have like three main um, initiatives. Um, first one is like a, an initiative for open digital public infrastructure, which this is an initiative that gets created in a, when local 
meet the, the global because it, at the beginning it started as a local initiative on in Argentina to build a better open infrastructure for electoral processes. Um, I'm, I'm from Argentina and the local necessities were like, okay, we need to build a, an open infrastructure for, for electoral processes. Um, and when we were like working on that, we created like a couple of round tables to, 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 to debate this with regions all across the world. But and at the same moment, like the G20 um, get together and started talking about like the digital public infrastructure and they created like a, an, an statement about like open di digital public infrastructure that could be open. And um, in, in the statement they say, no, no, we want the digital public infrastructure to be open. We don't want like to governments to push for like a digital infrastructure that can be open. And we, we want that statement to say is open. So then we merged like the local thing with the global thing and, and say, okay, yeah, pushing for like a digital public infrastructure, open digital public infrastructure for electoral processes is too narrow. Let's do it big. Um, so that's one of the initiatives that we are having and we are doing it by policy brief. This paper that I mentioned that we presented with the Argentinian uh, organization to the T20 is about like electoral processes and how to integrate openness into the electoral processes. The second initiative that we have um, is one that we call the tech we want, uh, which is the one that excites me the most because it's technical. Um, but it's basically like a meta discussion on how tech has become completely inaccessible for like organizations like us or governments like us. Um, the last 10 years of like Silicon Valley led technological development created a bubble that only Silicon Valley can pay for, technol for technology talent and only Silicon Valley can create applications. So how can we, and also they created tools that started like destroying the open nature of the web uh, in, in, in technical points of view that I'm, I'm not going to talk now, but um, this, this, uh, this initiative that we have that is called the Tech We One is a way to reclaim not only the open nature of the web on the internet, um, but also a way of creating technology that is accessible and affordable for like everyone and not only for like big tech corporations. And the last initiative is an advocacy initiative to improve our advocacy strategy. So it's kind of like a meta initiative. Um, basically, we are trying to kind of re reclaim um, a little bit uh, our leadership in the space of the open. I mean, it's no secret that the Open Knowledge Foundation has been a little bit sleepy in the last year. So we are trying to like, okay, reshape and rethink how we do advocacy to improve our advocacy and our presences. Um, and we have like several initiatives there. For example, uh, we started with Sarah here, like a regional coordinator program, um, because we have the Open Knowledge Foundation and then like a lot of chapters in 40 countries, but there is, is a huge gap. Uh, because local realities in different regions of the world are completely different. So we are like trying to put like a layer there of regional coordinators that can like coordinate the, re uh, the regional lo and realities. Um, we are like trying to put way more effort on the Open Data Day, which is like for us one of the, our best advocacy programs. Um, we have like this program, which is called 100 um, 100 plus conversations in which we are trying to get uh, people that is like open advocates uh, to help us like rethink and uh, what is important in, in, in this moment. Um, we are trying to like engage again in the open definition to reshape it, to make it like more suitable for like current needs, which is also important because there are like people that are trying to, to define, okay, what is open AI? And they're saying to us, okay, let's revisit it together because like the open definition impacts a lot in what is open, uh, open AI. And, and second one is trying to like design like a place because it has been like a long time since like all the open movements and all the organizations of the open movement had like a place to discuss together. Um, and I think that it's time for, for us as a movement to get together in a conference or in a place to discuss our movement and again. Um, because so far what we do is like, oh, let's do some side event in that conference. Let's do a side event. No, we, we, we need to get like all together to specifically discuss um, our movement. So in this initiative of like trying to reclaim our position or be more relevant is where the zero event comes in. 
um, because this is one of our ways to say, hey, we are present, we want to discuss, we want to engage with the community. And the Zero Day event uh, was basically um, an event in which we gather like 50 plus people um, of the Commons uh, community um, to start thinking on the advocacy agenda for like the next year. And we did like a two hours mapping exercise uh, to understand the threats, the opportunities and the events that kind of like uh, uh, of our for our movement um, we yeah we have like several groups discussing um, the results are going to be published and processed uh, we did it like two days ago so they are like not ready yet but we had like some clusters uh, of like initial inputs that we can like share that for example one of the um, the threads that we can see is like the platform is platformization locking of of the data and the commons now the, the platforms own the content um that we have like non-inclusive the proliferation of non-inclusive i models the appropriation of the open agenda of like for big tech and open washing and to put it more simple um the lobby power of monopolies is like a huge uh, threat to our movement um, and the lack of data literacy uh, that kind of was like the cluster um, of ideas that all, all share but in in that cluster of opportunities and threats we also find that sometimes like opportunities were also threats our threats are also opportunities and there are two for example i mean i'm talking that that one of the threats is the proliferation of non-inclusive i models but at the same time the proliferation of i models like that that aims to translation um, is like a huge improvement for communities because suddenly you have access to like you you remove a lot of the language barrier that local communities have um, and second like the, the, the threat of like lack of literacy is also like an opportunity for like the teaching teaching programs so like one thread is like we don't have literacy okay but this is also like an opportunity because we need to create um, programs to, to teach um, so that was kind of like a little bit the summary of the mapping exercise which as I said at the beginning for us as an organization is super important and because it's gonna literally our advocacy agenda for 2025 is gonna be based on this output and we are going to process it and publish it uh, in, in the upcoming days, weeks, after the summer, probably. Thank you very much. Alec? Um, I will be brief, uh, mindful of time. So I'll just highlight uh, one project also to show where, again, we see our role in a bigger ecosystem that sometimes I think in order to do advocacy, the important question is alignment among partners. And it is very hard. I must say uh, a lot of my work is getting rid of some naive ideas how we can align. Uh, we're doing, but the initiative I want to talk about is called AI uh, Principles for AI in the Commons. This is a project we're doing mainly with creative Commons, um, but also with other organizations it started last year at the CC Summit. And without going into details, just the sense that you need some principles. It's very important to together have principles that tell you. Initiatives, I think it really comes down to stewarding a healthy environment, a healthy and vibrant commons for the public goods. Um, and really thinking about the sustainability of that open infrastructure. My particular interest is also the content, the data, the information that runs through that infrastructure. So really ensuring that um, the information, the content that helps inform our world, like for example, climate research is available openly. And you know, I would love to see in a, a few years to be able to say that all of the climate research is available as open access. Um, so really working on initiatives like that. And also at CC, we, we have our open culture team that are engaging with other um, priorities in terms of applying open to culture and heritage. Otherwise, uh, we're thinking quite a lot about ethical licensing and responsible AI, just like everybody else. Um, you know, when CC was developed 20 years ago, it sort of found that space between all rights reserved and no rights reserved. And we're thinking about how to apply that today with AI. And, you know, there really is right now this binary of opt in or opt out in terms of if you your content, you know, you want your content to uh, participate or engage or be used with AI models. So what would it look like if there was more of a spectrum of choice? So we're calling that initiative preference signals. Um, we are really at the early stages of, of kind of seeing how we can ex uh, extrapolate some of the work that was done with the CC licenses now within the context of AI. So definitely more to come on that. Uh, I would say over the next year, we are planning workshops. We're gonna be engaging as much as possible 
Um, and part of this question was also how to engage. You know, I think uh, it, it invite us to your meetings, your events, and 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 really like the invitation here is ask us your challenging questions about licensing. You know, uh, challenge our thinking on how we're thinking about AI and copyright and the commons. So the more we know at Creative Commons about the needs of the open community when it comes to the comments, when it comes to the CC licenses, the more that we can be in service. Um, so, you know, I, I think like my colleagues here on this panel, the, the dream really would be to have this shared advocacy roadmap, a set of shared principles, and uh, like I'm really thinking these days about what we want to solve in this generation of open activists that we don't have to pass on to the next generation. Like what gift do we want to give them? Because those that have come before us, you know, gave us a gift and, and now we're trying to solve some issues as well. So um, finding alignment on that I think could be quite powerful because we are entering into this next big wave of digital sharing. Thank you so much to the panel for now. Uh, like I, I know that well, we have a little bit over seven minutes. Uh, we have Ponselet and Iglika, whom uh, I wanted to ask to maybe say a couple of words about the event. But if there are questions, you can like get them ready because this is uh, the next, <laughs> the next thing. So maybe Iglika Ivanova, if you could say a couple of words. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, both for the Tuesday's uh, workshops and uh, topics and for this one. And I, uh, I played an association game uh, while listening to your exposés and looking at the framing of this conversation, or you can call it this hours as well. And because I'm, I'm uh, here from an interesting perspective between academia and civic sector, but uh, also public administration, here are my thoughts, uh, because uh, what is the common to me between you, the advocacy work and media literacy is that we are the closest one to the audiences, so to the citizens. This is how I see it. And to, uh, one of the main challenges is to engage audiences. Okay, everyone is fighting for the engagement by the audiences. And uh, here are two main questions that we need to ask ourselves and to help audiences to probably understand and find some answers is what we have in common is the, um, well, the first question and what is at stake, which leads to multi-stakeholderism approach and how we have multi-stakeholderism approach without the audiences and the citizens. From then on, uh, the easiest part for me would be to just uh, promote what you do, because I strongly believe in it. And I strongly believe that it is through advocacy and through the civic sector and human rights organization that we have this presence in the public sphere. But at the same time, we have a work to do on uh, trust, reputation, from then on, on legitimacy. So uh, the audience is to recognize the importance of the work you or we do, uh, to be involved um, and to be, um, to, how advocacy is the answer, for example, to lobbyism because this is like the good and the bad actor in many cases. And um, uh, from then on, it is about knowledge, understanding. Uh, it is about participatory culture. So uh, this is um, because you've mentioned literacy a few times. Thank you for that. Uh, it is expanding, uh, expanding definition of this multiliteracy that we need. But again, my main question and probably the biggest challenge is how to engage and to bring audiences and citizens. I don't want to take more time. I think engagement takes time and patience and resources, and that's that's hard to have. Ponselet. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, I'll first start by the event that happened on Tuesday. I think the the biggest takeaway was the realization that we can agree to disagree, but all our um, the various organizations that sat on the table, whether it's Open Future, whether it's Creative Commons, um, Wikipedia Europe, my network, the um, Open Knowledge, they, they, they all have these shared aligned principles on um, building on advocacy for the common good. And I will say that one of the most important things that came out for me looking at that ending with this, which is sort of like a review process and moving ahead, is the ability for us to know our opportunities, our threats that exist. And it was all discussed w with um, great openness. And that shows um, the realization that um, among all 
the networks involved, we are ready to um, come out with really a, a, a common agenda on advocacy. In terms of events, you know, um, my colleague Pato talked about um, l looking at it at the high level. We have the Internet Governance Forum. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I've, I've been involved since 2003 when it started as a young, as a young person uh, with the WISIS process and in Geneva and going to Tunis with the Association for Progressive Communications, which I now sit on the board, APC. And one thing I noticed with that process, now we have regional IGFs, whether it's Eurodig, whether it's LANIC in, in Latin America, whether it's the African IGF, we should be involved in those processes because all the stakeholders are there. The academia we are talking about, they are also involved. A lot, the, um, the IGF is now very involved in what I will call um, the Global Digital Compact, which is going to be discussed in the Summit of the Future. We have to have a stake because this third objective is for an inclusive, open and safe um, digital space. And that's all what we are talking about. Everything we are, we are doing here it has to be open in the digital space. So I want us, we listed those events on Tuesday. We should um, check those events. We should be involved in those events and we should see how we should collaborate. And our academics are very involved in the IGF. During the open climate session, Rebecca and everybody that was there really talked about linking ac academics. Um, Alex mentioned it is very important that we have to get our academics involved. If we are to do good advocacy, all our young people, they are in universities um, in every continent of the world. For that, for the work we do to reach those younger generation, what they call the Gen Z, that we affect everything we are doing, our academics have to be involved. Thank you. Thank you. We have a bit less than two minutes. There is a question. There is a remark. Oh my God, I'm as that person going to say it's not a question, it's more a reaction. I might still be able to <laughs> respond. Okay, um, it's just absolutely agree with what you've said, um, but it made me think about, and I'm super happy to see so many organizations actually coming together to actually have that discussion and uh, move forward together. But in the same time, I can't prevent myself from thinking that um, it's not obviously that easy to align. I think everybody knows that in that room because you have leadership issues after the, when you have trying to, you're trying to align different NGOs. But I, it also reminded me that beyond the question of leadership, you also have this question of fundraising, how you're going to fund your programs, and if the person that are actually, if the organization funding those programs is also aligned with the fact that you can have a common, uh, you know, com common activities, because we often have like a, pro a programmatic uh, funds, for instance, grants, and then it's agree like really your NGO that has to be on the, the work, and then we don't always think about how we are so influenced by those grants or like fun, fun that we receive and it's another issue obviously but um, and I don't have solutions yeah no just to to reply to you to say okay how can we engage with those communities and with those audiences um, I think that our movement uh, once it gets aligned it needs to start like talking and participating in communities outside of our comfort zone we have like two beautiful experiences with the Open Knowledge Foundation that we did this year because well, in one of our approaches for advocacy is like going outside of our bubble. Um, the first one, we got invited to the ACP, to the Austria Center for Peace Forum, um, like one month ago. And we started talking with uh, peace activists there and the interaction between like the openness and technology and data with the peace activists was amazing. We got so many feedback about like how the two communities, what are the necessities, what they were. And I can work, I can think as well, like Wikimedia movement, like in, in, in terms of war, I mean, Wikipedia is like a active ground battle. Um, so I think that a, a combination, for example, there with peace activists and Wikipedia, from, from that can happen magnificant things. And the second one is like with the open data editor, like a tool that we are building, our product owner is a journalist. So we are going to the journalist uh, events, for example, um, and that's a community that needs data, that needs openness, that does not understand openness. I in Argentina also, like in a non-profit, work a lot with journalists. And when you go outside your communities and start talking with people outside your bubble, it, it, automatically, like uh, the engagement can generate. 
Thank you, that was amazing. We're out of time. Maybe also climate activists. I think this is also a conversation worth plugging into. But thank you very much for coming to this session. Have a wonderful rest of Wikimania. If we could maybe give a round of applause to everyone who spoke. Uh, <laughs> and as you see, these organizations have plans and we will be communicating about them. So I hope we can collaborate in the future. Hashtag collaboration. Thank you.